Good morning, and thank you for uh, joining class this morning. Uh, can I ask uh, Siddhikinu to lead us in prayer, please, before we begin? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Lord, thank you for this day you have given us, Lord. Lord, whatever we are going to learn from your word, Lord, let it should not be wasted, but it should be added, Lord, and we should be adding, keep we keep on adding to the knowledge of your kingdom of God so that we can do the, if the ministry, the purpose you have planned in our life effectively, Lord. Lord, thank you for this hour. Thank you for this teacher. Thank you for all the students, Lord, who, which, who and all are here, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so uh, last uh, Friday, we began looking at uh, uh, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we began looking at, uh, in fact, last Wednesday, we started looking at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Um, last Friday, we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. And we also began looking at the gifts of the Spirit and how the uh, and uh, we will be looking at how the Holy Spirit ministers through uh, these gifts that He uh, enables uh, in our lives. So the first thing that we saw in the gifts of the Spirit is the gifts of the Spirit are uh, given to all believers, to every man, woman. Um, so can even children receive the gifts of the Spirit? Can even children be baptized in the Holy Spirit and can children also uh, flow and manifest the gifts of the Spirit? Yes, yes. Yes, thank you, uh, John. Thank you, Zilatoli. Uh, children can also manifest the gifts of the Spirit. Now, when we say that the gifts of the Spirit are a manifestation of the Spirit, what do we mean? What do we mean by saying that the gifts of the Spirit are a manifestation of the Spirit? I explained this on Friday. Anyone remembers? <laughs> what does it mean that the gifts of the Spirit are a manifestation of the Spirit? It means that the Holy Spirit himself is expressing all of who he is, expressing uh, <clears throat> himself uh, or making himself known through the gifts of the Spirit. So it is making visible the person, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit through supernatural works. So through supernatural works, the Holy Spirit is making visible his person, his presence and his, and his power. So you can remember the three Ps, person, presence, and power. Okay, so when we say that uh, the gifts of the Spirit are a manifestation of the Spirit, uh, we mean that it is the Holy Spirit expressing himself, or he's making himself, uh, he's making the his person, his presence, and his power visible through the supernatural works. And we also uh, saw that the gifts of the Spirit are given to edify uh, people uh, and to glorify Christ. Okay, And then there was a, uh, two good questions from uh, Zilotoli. Uh, one of the questions is, is speaking in tongues. I, I, I don't know if I'm framing it right, I'm saying it correctly, but uh, I think this is her question. Is speaking in tongues the only outward manifestation uh, of being baptized in the Spirit? Um, and, and we said, yes, it is, because if you look at the, the five um, uh, recorded instances in the book of Acts, uh, one is Acts chapter 2, uh, where um, uh, the disciples, the 120 of them in the upper room on the day of Pentecost were baptized. They started speaking in different tongues, um, different languages. So it was not gibberish language or unknown language. It was something that... Uh, uh, people from other nations who had come to Jerusalem to ce celebrate the Passover were able to understand it. Um, but uh, these Gentile, um, uh, uh, sorry, these um, Galileans, not Gentiles, these Galilean uh, 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 disciples, uh, the 120 of them, uh, spoke in languages which they have never learned, they never knew. But all of them were speaking different languages of different nations and they were all praising God. 
so we see them speaking in tongues. Uh, that's first recorded instance. And the second one we have is uh, when Philip, after the persecution breaks out, uh, Stephen is uh, martyred and persecution breaks out in Jerusalem. The, the disciples, the believers, they scatter. When Philip goes to Samaria, he... Uh, Know, preaches the word and um, uh, it is attested with great mighty signs, miracles and wonders and people accept uh, the word and they are baptized in water. When Peter and John hear about it, they go to Samaria. Uh, they see that they have accepted Christ, they are baptized in, uh, in water, but they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, he, uh, he baptizes them in the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't mention uh, in that recorded uh, uh, event that, uh, you know, uh, that um, all of them in Samaria, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, spoke in tongues, uh, but they say it was, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And those who were, um, you know, magicians and the sorcerers, uh, son, they were amazed at, uh, at uh, the supernatural work or amazed at how the people, uh, you know, were flowing in the, the gifts. So it's most po uh, possible that they spoke in tongues. The other uh, third recorded event uh, or instance in the book of Acts is uh, when Ananias goes to, uh, you know, um, minister to Paul after his uh, encounter on the road to Damascus. And we see that, um, you know, he goes and prays that his eyes will be open. He receives back his um, eyesight, his vision. And also, uh, you know, uh, uh, Paul is baptized in the Holy Spirit and then he's taken and baptized in water. It does not mention in that instant uh, in Acts that uh, uh, Paul is um, spoken tongues. But uh, we know if you read, um, uh, I think, uh, First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, uh, Paul says, no, I speak in tongues more than any one of you. Okay, so we know that uh, he would have spoken in tongues. But um, that's the third uh, instance. The fourth and the fifth instance, we do have, um, uh, we do have uh, proof that, um, you know, they spoke in tongues. One is uh, in Acts chapter, I think it is Acts chapter 10, uh, where... Um, uh, Philip goes to uh, Cornelius's house in Acts chapter 10 and uh, all of them, uh, Cornelius and all of them in his house are Gentile, uh, uh, Gentiles and uh, we see that Peter starts preaching the gospel and they all uh, who are there gathered, you know, uh, uh, are cut in their heart. That means they realize that they are sinners, they are sinful and they would have ex uh, accepted Christ even before um, you know, uh, Peter gave them an altar call and we see that, um, uh, you know, um, and they started speaking in uh, tongues. Um, let me just tell you. Yeah. So verse 44 of Acts chapter 10, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fill, fell upon all those who heard the word. And we see that um, uh, all the Jews who had gone along with Peter were astonished uh, uh, because the gift of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, had been poured out on the Gentiles for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So we see here that, uh, you know, they started speaking in tongues. That is how Peter and uh, the uh, other uh, 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 disciples who had gone along with um, uh uh, with Peter, we're surprised that uh, the Gentiles were also uh, baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we have another uh, incident in, um, in I think, in Acts chapter 14, where, um, uh, you know, um, Peter goes to, uh, or Paul goes to uh, Ephesus, and we see that... Uh, you know, they're, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit and the people start uh, speaking in tongues. Okay. So that is another recorded uh, uh, instance in, um, in Acts. So these are the five recorded instances where we see uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we see that, uh, you know, they start uh, speaking in tongues. In, but uh, three of the five recorded we have, that they spoke in tongues, but uh, two of them, we don't have it uh, mentioned. Um, uh, 
so we see that you know uh, uh, the first visible uh, sign that people are baptized in the Holy Spirit is yes, uh, speaking in tongues. Um, uh, I, what I told you about Paul going to Ephesus is in Acts chapter nineteen, and Acts chapter nineteen verse six uh, it says that when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and they prophesied as well. Okay. Uh, so yes, the answer is yes, uh, because we have all these five recorded instances in the book of Acts that they spoke in tongues. Uh, you know, three of them we see in the scriptures recorded for us that they spoke in tongues. Two is not, but we know that they did because Paul did speak in tongues and we see that people were amazed when uh, the people in Samaria were baptized because they would have spoken in um, tongues. So this is something that is normal and what is expected. But yes, definitely the Holy Spirit can choose to manifest any other gifts other than speaking in tongues. Uh, when a believer is baptized in the Holy Spirit, like here we see in Acts chapter 19, when uh, uh, Paul is uh, praying for the, believe, uh, for the believers at Ephesus, you know, they speak in tongues and also they begin to uh, prophesy. So yes, the Holy Spirit can work, so they can, um, uh, you know, uh, manifest any other gifts other than speaking in tongues. Uh, but um, however, you know, our goal is to see that the believer is at activated and flowing in all uh, the nine gifts of the Spirit when we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we encourage uh, believers um, uh, and, uh, and, and get them to desire and expect them to speak with other tongues when uh, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some can speak uh, at that very moment when we are praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But some people later on as they're going home or after a day or two or after a week, um, uh, they start speaking in tongues. Uh, I know of one person who testified saying that, uh, you know, he had gone uh, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and um, he didn't speak in tongues at that moment. But a couple of days later, as he was going to work, he was on his bike on the road driving. He was just praising God and suddenly he started speaking in tongues. Um, tongues. So uh, yes, we expect uh, believers when we are praying for them to start speaking with uh, uh, speaking in other tongues. Um, uh, and sooner or later, they do start speaking in tongues. And we do not stop there. We encourage them to earnestly desire to flow in all uh, the nine gifts of the spirit. Okay, so that was uh, 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 what I said for, uh, you know, the gifts, of the sp I mean, uh, regarding Zilatoli's question. Uh, I also mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, on Friday in our class that, um, you know, there are two different aspects. One is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The other is the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. So one is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The other is the infilling power power of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit comes and lives and dwells in us the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. The infilling power of the Holy Spirit is what we receive when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the difference between these two? Um, let's look at uh, two references which will help us to understand the difference. One is in John chapter 4 verses 13 and 14. The other is in John chapter 7 verses 37 and 39. Uh, so can one of you please read John chapter 4 verse 13 and 14 and the other can read uh, John chapter 7 verse 37 and 39 please. John 4 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Thank you. So remember this phrase, fountain of water, uh, uh, you know, will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Uh, can one of you please read uh, John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39, please? On the last day that 
great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Thank you. So here we see that uh, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay. So in John chapter 4, um, you know, uh, Jesus spoke about the fountain, fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. And in John chapter 7, he speaks of a river. Now this fountain is within the believer and the river uh, is something that flows out of a believer so you said uh, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water and in john chapter 4 he says a fountain of water in him okay so the fountain of water uh, in him is something uh, a fountain brings eternal life for the believer that's what we read the fountain of water springing up into eternal life so this is the indwelling um, uh, presence of the holy spirit so when we accept jesus as our lord and savior the holy spirit comes and lives in us and uh, it's like a fountain that brings eternal life for the believer and in john chapter 7 the river flowing out of a believer is the presence and the power of the holy spirit which is made available to um, others through the believers. So, you know, uh, when we preach, teach, when we pray for miracles, signs, miracles, and wonders, uh, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is made available through us. Uh, uh, that is, of course, the work of the Holy Spirit in us uh, to other believers, to other people. So it's the same water uh, because uh, the, the symbol for the Holy Spirit is water. It's the same water, but it has different measures and different purposes okay the purpose for the fountain is to bring eternal life we enjoy eternal life here and now uh, i said it's a realized eschatology though it is something that happens way in the future eschatology is something that happens way in the future so hope that we will realize uh, the full uh, uh, beauty or the full uh, 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 magnitude uh, or the measure of eternal life when uh, we are, are with christ in heaven but it's also something that we realize now eternal life so um, it is um, uh, you know it's a fountain that uh, brings eternal life for each one of us and it's also a river that flows out of us uh, the presence and the power of the holy spirit uh, is manifested through the gifts of the spirit uh, through us to other uh, believers so it's the same holy spirit it's the same work of the holy spirit but there is different measure and um, purpose uh, so when we are baptized with the holy spirit we receive both the power and the gifts uh, that the, the you know the spirit of God endures us or clothes us or covers us with his power and all of the nine gifts is uh, potentially available to the believer from this point on okay so we receive the gifts from that point on after we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. So that is answering uh, Zilatori's other question. Okay so that is a, re a review of what we uh, uh, listened or uh, uh, we studied on uh, Friday. Now moving on, uh, the gifts of the Spirit are no indication of spiritual maturity. Uh, there is a difference between uh, spirituality and there's a difference between spiritual maturity. Uh, spirituality, what do you think is spirituality? And what do you think is spiritual maturity? Spirituality is basically when you're sensitive to things, uh, the spiritual things, okay? So can only uh, believers be sensitive to spiritual things or can even non-believers be sp sensitive to spiritual things? This is a uh, question that it's an easy question. I'm sure all of you can answer. So can only believers, uh, born again believers be sensitive to spiritual things or even non-believers can be 
sensitive to spiritual king, uh, things. Can non-believers be spiritual? Yeah, thank you, Zilatoli. Yes, non-believers too can be spiritual. We see many of our non-believer friends uh, very, very spiritual. Okay, so uh, basically spirituality is when you're sensitive to spiritual things. Maturity, what do you think is maturity? What do you think is Christian maturity? Anyone can try to answer what you think is spiritual maturity. Okay, spiritual maturity is uh, being Christ-like. It's Christ-likeness. Okay. Uh, so can a believer be spiritual and yet be uh, immature? What do you think? Can a believer, a born-again person be spiritual and can be immature? Okay, thank you. Zilatoli, yes. Only Zilatoli is answering. What about the others? Do you think uh, you can be spiritual and very mature as well? Yes, some of us who are born again can be very spiritual, but we can also be uh, immature. Uh, remember, I said on our class on Friday that, uh, you know, uh, Paul was when he was writing to the church at Corinth, uh, you know, I said that the church at Corinth, all of them were flowing in all the nine gifts. And they were very eager when they come to church on Sunday because someone had a word of wisdom, one had a word of knowledge, one had prophecy, one was speaking in tongues, one was ready to interpret the tongues. And they were all so excited. They were just waiting to just share and pour out everything that, uh, you know, uh, that they had received. So we, we see this in First Corinthians chapter 1, verses uh, 4 to 7. Uh, you know, when Paul is writing to them and saying, I thank God always concerning you for the grace of God, um, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterances and all knowledge. And he says in verse 7, uh, so that you come short in no gift. That means you fall short in no gift. You are all manifesting all the gifts and, e and eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus. Uh, Christ. Okay, so we see that all of them uh, were very, very um, sensitive to the things uh, of the Spirit. They were flowing in the gifts. They were very spiritual. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul, in the same letter to the same church at Corinth, the churches at Corinth, he's saying, um, uh, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal as to babes in Christ. So he calls them very carnal. And we know when we, wherever this word carnal is uh, mentioned in the Bible, it's talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, our flesh uh, reigning over our spirit man, uh, our carnal nature uh, uh, reigning in control over our spirit man. And he says that you are babes in Christ. That means you are very spiritually immature. So yes, you know, people can be... Uh, uh, very sensitive to the key things of the spirit. They can be very spiritual, like we see at the church, uh, the people of the churches in Corinth, but, you know, they can even be very um, immature, okay? So a believer could be very spiritual and yet be very immature, and it's the Holy Spirit who makes us more like Christ. Um, how does he make us more like Christ when he begins the work of uh, sanctification in our lives, okay? Okay. Um, so, um, you know, when we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, uh, we are able to recognize and release his gifts. That means we are able to recognize uh, what the Holy Spirit wants us to do at that very given moment. And uh, we are ready to minister. Uh, and we are ready, and uh, when we are ready to minister, we act in faith. We take that step. The Holy Spirit just releases the gifts in uh, us. Okay. Uh, so we can be spiritually sensitive, we can be keen to the things of the Spirit. Uh, when we are keen to the things of the Spirit, we become very responsive to the move of the Holy Spirit, what He's asking us to do, what He wants us to do, what He wants to speak out, what He wants to say, what He wants us to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's able to manifest the gifts in and through 
uh, us. And so this makes us more zealous and more passionate and full of faith about the supernatural. But spiritual maturity has to do with our character, our growth in uh, spiritual understanding and growing in Christ likeness. And it's important that we have to develop in both areas. We need to be sensitive to the things of the spirit. Uh, and we also have to be uh, spiritually mature. Okay. Uh, so these uh, gifts are not uh, a sign of a great, uh, uh, the signs of, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the gifts of the spirit that we manifest in, that we flow in, is not a sign of great spiritual maturity, or it's not some badge that we put on as a personal achievement, uh, but these are works of grace, uh, just like salvation is a work of grace in our lives. It's not by anything that we have done. It's not by our good works. Uh, salvation is by grace through faith. And so also receiving the gifts of the Spirit is works of grace, uh, which is expressed through the believer. Uh, and all we need to do is we need to be available and ready uh, and also learn how to cooperate and work along with the Holy Spirit to manifest these gifts. So these gifts are basically, uh, you know, belonging to the Holy Spirit. And he's the one who releases or manifests it in and through us. But we need to be willing. Uh, we need to step out in faith, in love. Uh, and we need to be willing to uh, cooperate with the Holy Spirit, uh, ready and available for him to use uh, us and to release his uh, gifts. Okay. So that is about the gifts of the Spirit, uh, you know, are no indication of spiritual maturity, but we need to uh, grow uh, sensitive and keen to the things of the Spirit. And also we need to, um, uh, you know, grow more in Christ, into Christ's likeness. Now, can the gifts of the Spirit be manifested anywhere at any time? Can the gifts of the Spirit be manifested anywhere at any time? Yes, no? Yes. Yes, thank you, success. Yes, the gifts of the Spirit can be manifested anywhere and at any time. Um, now, when we desire to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to manifest this, the gifts, uh, we need to do that in, uh, in love, in maintaining our love walk with the Lord. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, uh, Paul says, But earnestly desire these best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. And then he goes to talk about uh, love. Okay, so the more excellent way is love. Okay, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may um, prophesy. So, um, you know, uh, concerning the gifts of the Spirit, the instruction in Scripture is that we need to walk in the more excellent way, or way, and that is way of love, and pursue love. That means uh, when, uh, you know, uh, uh, manifesting the gifts of the Spirit or ministering to people uh, through the gifts of the Spirit uh, uh, should be done, you know, for because we love people, because we want them to uh, receive answers from God. We want them to see breakthroughs in their life. We want them to experience God's healing. Uh, we want them to know what God the plans God has for them ahead of them, uh, ahead of their uh, ahead of their journey in life. We want them to be edified, strengthened, encouraged in their faith. Um, we want them also to grow uh, in in their love for God, and so. Uh, you know, when we seek to manifest a gift, when we're praying for somebody, we want to give them a word of wisdom, a knowledge, a word of knowledge, or want to prophesy over them, or we want to see them healed, uh, we do that all motivated out of love for people. Um, and so our uh, expression of the gifts of the Spirit uh, uh, to people must be undergirded by love. And I said in the previous class that it should not be because um, we want fame or uh, we want uh, people to know how spiritual we are or supernatural we are. Uh, you know, we don't want position fame, but we want to do it to bring glory to Christ. And it should be motivated out of love for people, not out of self-promotion or, uh, or uh, gaining fame for our 
selves. Okay. Uh, we can release the gifts through faith. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 6. Can one of you please read Romans chapter 12, verse 6, please? Romans chapter 12, verse 6. Heaven then gives different according to the grace that is given to us. Let us then, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Thank you. Um, so we see that faith is very much involved in exercising the spiritual gifts and uh, grace as well, because we receive that by grace, but we need to activate uh, the faith, uh, the seeds of faith in our life. Um, uh, and we see that, um, you know, our faith can grow, uh, like we read in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Um, you know, so when our faith increases, uh, we are able to also flow mightily and freely and powerfully uh, in the gifts of the uh, spirit and we are able to prophesy in greater measures uh, in, and uh, we can see greater expressions of the gifts of the uh, spirit manifested in our lives in proportion to the faith that we have. So we need to grow in our faith. We need to, our faith needs to increase and as our faith increases, uh, we will see greater measures and greater expressions of uh, the gifts of the spirit manifested in our lives. Now it says here we have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. So uh, do all of us, uh, when we are baptized in the in the gifts of the Spirit, do all of us flow in nine all the nine gifts, or uh, does the Holy Spirit choose to give five to some, three to some, four to some, and uh, you know uh, six to the rest? What do you think? All the gifts. Thank you, Isaac. Yes, we uh, we uh, we flow in all the nine gifts of the Spirit, but here it says we have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us, which means that you know uh, at a set point in time or when we're ministering to somebody, we need to know that these gifts of the uh, these gifts are gifts of the Spirit, and it is Him manifesting in and through us. Uh, so, you know, it's the Holy Spirit will know what is the appropriate gifts to be manifested at that time as we are ministering to a person. Now, for example, a person comes to you and uh, is, um, uh, is very sick, okay? So, uh, you know, for that we, we won't need, uh, for what, what are the gifts that we would need at that time? Maybe we, we need the gifts of healing, we would need the working of miracles, we would need uh, uh, faith, we would need discerning of spirits, even sometimes we would need discerning of spirits to know if it is caused by an uh, evil spirit, or this is, uh, you know, it is, uh, 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 or we would need a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge to know it is this sickness caused by any, um, uh, you know, um, uh, accident that has happened in the past or any hurt or any bitterness um, or we need discerning of spirits to know if the person has been involving himself in some kind of wrong sinful activity and as a result of it uh, he's suffering with the sickness so you know we do not know what is the right gifts to uh, be ministered to the person at that time. So it's the Holy Spirit who will at that time manifest the right gifts in and through us so that the person can be um, ministered uh, to. So, but we see that, you know, we flow in all the nine gifts of the Spirit, but it's the, uh, uh, the gifts of the Spirit are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which means it is his, his presence, his power, um, uh, that is working in and through us, so it is Him who will discern and know which is the right gifts to be um, uh, uh, to be released at that moment in time, and He will release those gifts so that the person we are ministering to uh, will be ministered to, uh, will be blessed, will be um, redeemed, will be uh, healed, uh, will be restored. Okay, or will receive encouragement and edification in their faith. 
The eighth thing is that we can uh, often several gifts can flow in conjunction with one another uh, to accomplish a specific work that God wants done. I already explained that just now, uh, but we do not become too rigid about the classification and the categorization of uh, uh, the gifts of the spirit. That means, uh, you know, we do not be rigid and saying no, only this should flow at this time, only we need to minister only in these gifts at this time. Uh, you know, it's not us, but it is the uh, it is the Holy Spirit who's working in us. So uh, what do we mean by uh, the classification or the categorization of uh, the gifts? Basically, people have categorized the uh, uh, these gifts in um, in three different categories. One is um, the vocal gifts, which is uh, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy, because it's all spoken. Uh, revelation gifts is something that uh, you know gifts that reveal something about that person, about the person's past, present, future, uh, what God wants to reveal. So it is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Uh, that is the revelation gifts and the power gifts is gifts that do something. So gifts of healing and working of miracles. So the vocal gifts, gifts that say something, tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. Uh, revelation gifts, gifts that reveal something that is word of wisdom, uh, word of knowledge in discerning of spirits. And there is the power gifts, gifts that do something that is bring about healing or working of miracles. Okay, so um, we just uh, know that we've flown all the nine gifts and um, the Holy Spirit as he chooses, yes, like Rubega said, as he chooses, will reveal um, uh, the gifts uh, that is appropriate at a specific point in time as we're ministering to uh, different people. Okay, the ninth thing is that the gifts of the Spirit empower ministry offices. Uh, what are the ministry offices now? Um, the ministry offices, the ministry gifts that we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Now we have the spiritual gifts, uh, which we saw all of these spiritual gifts, uh, which is mentioned to us in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 12. And then we also have the uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which talks about the spiritual gifts. We have the ministry gifts that is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. What are these ministry gifts? Uh, people called different ministry offices, such as uh, office of an evangelist, a teacher, a pastor, a prophet, and an apostle. So this is called the ministry gifts where people are called to specific offices. And that is, again, uh, what God chooses for each one of us, uh, what the Holy Spirit ordains for each one of us. Uh, so it can be an evangelist, teacher, pastor, prophet, and an apostle. And then, of course, there is the membership gift, which we read in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. I'm sure you've studied all about this in your course on the Holy Spirit in the last semester. So the membership gifts is what every believer has one or more of the membership gifts. But the ministry gifts is given specifically to a few specific ministry offices that they are called to. But every believer will flow in one or more of the membership gifts, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, given to us, illustrated for us in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. So what are the uh, membership gifts? Prophecy, uh, ministry, teaching, encouragement, uh, giving, leadership, showing mercy, compassion, and uh, other things like help, administration, and speaking in tongues. Now, when we go to church, I'm sure, uh, you know, some of the churches that you worship at, most of the believers all speak in tongues. Uh, some of them have uh, the gift of uh, service. They are serving in different teams. Uh, some of them have the gift of prophecy, so they minister prophetically. Uh, some people have the gift of encouragement. They go around encouraging people uh, to their words, to their prayer, to, uh, you know, giving gifts or uh, just helping. Uh, some people are constantly, you know, um, uh, uh, giving to others. It just, just pour in to the lives of others by just giving some of them a leadership, uh, some of them just helping out, even laying out chairs or serving tea, some of them who are in administration um, work. So um, 
you know, Paul is writing to the church at Rome and he's saying, you know, if your gift is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. Uh, if it's prophecy, do it accordance with your faith. Um, if it is giving, give generously. If it is lead, uh, leading, do it diligently. And if it's showing mercy, do it very cheerfully. Okay, so um, the point here is that uh, the gifts of the Spirit not only empower those who are in ministry offices, but the gifts of the Spirit can also empower those in membership gifts. Okay, so you think, why do people who are serving tea, or why do people who are showing mercy, or why is people who are um, giving generously, why do they need to be empowered in the gifts of the Spirit or flow in the gifts of the Spirit? Well, um, maybe they need to, uh, uh, you know, they can, they can know who to minister to, who to give, how much to give, uh, who to show mercy to, who needs God's mercy and compassion, who needs the encouragement, what is the word of encouragement. So uh, it can be a word of encouragement in the form of a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, it can be prophecy, uh, it can be a word of encouragement even through healing. Um, as I said, even in the last class, you know, even when you're serving tea, people can flow in the gifts of the Spirit, you know, they're giving out tea, but suddenly the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, this person who we're giving tea to now uh, is going through divorce or there's a single parent and she's struggling with her children or um, he is uh, you know is uh, has been unwell and uh, the doctors have said he's having the sickness so why don't you pray for him so you're just serving tea but you can flow in the gifts of the spirit uh, you are um, you know somebody who is um, uh, you know uh, taking the offering, you're passing on the offering bags and you know God is saying in this row, can you see the person with the, the red dress? Now that person is going through um, you know, a struggle. So after church you go and meet them, you say are you going through some struggle or challenge in life? And the person say, how do you know? Uh, you know, God just told me, he didn't tell me of course what is your struggle and challenge, but let me pray for you. You just pray, just imagine how you can just be flowing in the gifts of the spirit or you're just laying chairs and when you're laying chairs you're just praying over each of those chairs and you uh, one chair you're just praying and you know supernaturally you're just saying god whoever sits on this chair let their death be cancelled and the person you know the holy spirit will lead that person to sit there their death will be cancelled uh, now we're not talking about magic here uh, it's not about magic but it's about just how we can flow supernaturally uh, through any uh, uh, gifting that God has given us, whether it's even just encouragement, uh, showing mercy, giving generously, uh, just blessing that uh, person or letting the supernatural work of God just flow in and through our lives. Just imagine if all of us uh, in the church with membership gifts, all of us have membership gifts, only a few of, of them are called to ministry offices. All of us are flowing Mightily in the gifts of the spirit, what a powerful church it will be. I've I've even heard people, um, churches, you know, when they are, uh, uh, when they uh, have a program and people come in and at the signing desk, you know, the registration desk, people are just registering, but the uh, Holy Spirit is manifesting himself through the people who are ministering at that desk just for registration. And they're just taking that person aside and praying and the person is healed, the person is receiving a word of wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, something. And wow, it's even before they enter the, the meeting or they enter the uh, conference, they are just being blessed by somebody who's just at the registration desk. So imagine uh, if all of us in the church have this whole idea that even if you're doing something small, uh, doing setup or serving tea or just um, welcoming people, you know, welcoming people, shaking hand, uh, receiving a word of knowledge, prophecy, or just God saying, pray for their healing in their back or their leg or knee. Imagine before they enter service, they are just being blessed and they're saying, wow, what a church this is. I need to come here. I, I can receive God. I can, and they will learn to flow in the same way because uh, they also are pursuing God. So the gifts of the spirit is, uh, you know, uh, something that we can flow in and through anything that we do, even when we are cooking, baking, you know, if we are doing carpentry work, if we are even mechanics, 
uh, software engineers, teachers, teachers, what an impact we can have over children, lecturers, uh, you're doing gardening. Just imagine, you know, uh, just let the supernatural work of God just flow in and through your life. Uh, people will just sense uh, the power and the presence of the living God. Okay. That's just to encourage all of us to uh, not just look at gifts of the Spirit as something like, oh, wow, it's something great, but something that we can do in through uh, small mundane chores or mundane activities that we are involved in every day of our lives. Okay, that is um, a little bit extra about uh, the gifts of the Spirit. I'm sure you've learned more about the gifts of the Spirit, so I've not gone into quite uh, in-depth and length. I've just kind of mentioned the important points. Uh, some of them are not there in your notes, but I've just mentioned it. Any questions? Anything that you'd like to ask? Anything you'd like to say? Okay, if not, uh, can we just um, uh, quickly just decide the dates for uh, the other assessments, please? Uh, so your assessment for uh, the next assessment for uh, Christology is March 28th, am I right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, success. Uh, can we uh, have a date for uh, the third assessment as well? When can be our third assessment for Christology? One is March 28th, the other one? Can we say uh, March... Um, Sorry, April 6th, is that okay? The last assessment, the third assessment, April 6th? Sure. Okay, thank you. It's too so close. It's too close, ma'am. It's too close. It's too close, okay. Yes, ma'am. What about eight? Can we make, can we make it ten, ma'am? Ten? Ten is yes, uh, Sunday. So can I make it eleven? Oh. Yes, eleven will be fine. Okay. Is 11 okay for everyone else? Okay, yes, thank sir. you. Okay, so we'll have the second assessment March 28th, the third assessment April 11th. Now for your doctrinal foundation, we had, we just finished one assessment, right? Uh, so when can we have the second assessment? Can we have it next Wednesday, March 23rd? Sure. It's okay. It's okay. Sure. Okay, March 23rd. Thank you. And what about the third assessment? You have, uh, you can have it once in, uh, we can have it in April. Is April 15th okay? You're having your Christology on April 11th. So is April 15th fine? Okay, boss. Sure. Thank you, John. What about the others? It's okay, ma'am. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, your assessment dates, the second assessment for Doctrinal Foundation Systematic Theology is March 23rd. The third assessment will be on April 15th. Uh, your second assessment for Christology is March 28th. And the third assessment will be April 11th. Okay. Yeah. So that's about your assessments. Uh, there's no questions and we'll end class here. Just, just one more minute. No questions?
Okay, then thank you everyone for uh, joining class. Have uh, a good day and I'll see you on uh, Friday.